Good morning, everyone. Today we have uh, Chiara and Mauri, uh, both affiliated to Harvard Medical School, Martino Center, and uh, DTU, which is the, um, the Danish Technical University, and is going to give a talk about uh, uh, accurate and explainable image-based uh, prediction uh, using a lightweight generative model. When you want, you can start the presentation. Okay, thank you. So do you see my screen right? Yep. Okay, thank you. It's not going. <laughs> Just a second. Yes. Okay. So the aim of image-based prediction is to estimate a variable of interest X, such as a subject diagnosis or a prognosis from a medical scan T. And since imaging is very sensitive to subtle anatomical changes, this has several applications, such as early diagnosis. So diagnosis a disease earlier than what can be done only with the clinical assessment, for example. It helps with the therapy planning and monitoring, allowing a more personalized treatment. And a particular application of image-based prediction is to predict the age of a subject based on the brain scan. And this allows to compute the so-called brain age gap, which is the difference between predicted and chronological age, which is a potential biomarker of healthy aging and neurological disease. In particular, there are several diseases for which this gap can be a potential biomarker. Here, for example, we see in different colors the distribution of the brain age gap for different um, computed on cohorts with different disorders. And in gray, there is the distribution of the gap for uh, cohorts of healthy controls, that is age and sex matched. And we can see that the, this brain age gap, the disease has a significant effect on this brain age gap for disorders such as dementia, mild cognitive impairment, multiple sclerosis, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. But we can now dive more into image-based prediction methods. But first, I want to do a distinction. So this method can be either discriminative or generative. So a discriminative method directly predicts the target variable X from the medical scan T. Instead, generative methods model the image as a function of the target variable and then needs to be inverted to make predictions about the variable X. So it's somehow more indirect way of making predictions. So the field in image-based prediction has mainly focused on deep discriminative learning methods, which can achieve excellent prediction performances, but they might also suffer from some potential limitations. So first, deep learning methods can be hard to interpret. In fact, commonly used explanation methods such as silency maps are useful for highlighting which areas in the image are being used for predictions, but they do not reveal why specific voxels are given attention. And additionally, in typical applications, the size of the training set is often limited. In fact, while methods for predicting age, for example, can count on tens of thousands of data, which is a scenario where deep learning methods can predict extremely well, in typical applications, the sizes are much more limited. For example, a recent survey of over 200 studies on predictions of brain disorders reported an average sample size of only 186 subjects, so quite small. And here we have the histogram of the sample sizes of the studies uh, reported in this survey, and it shows that the mean and median sample size are really small. And even in the UK Biobank, which is the world's largest imaging project, the number of subjects with quite common diseases is uh, fairly limited. For example, in 2022, there are around 900 subjects with stroke, 900 subjects with Alzheimer, and 600 with Parkinson in this data set, which is still quite limited. So it's important to develop methods that can learn efficiently also from fairly small sample sizes. And finally, deep learning methods can be cumbersome to use with many knobs to turn, such as the choice of architecture, training loss, data augmentation scheme, and several hyperparameters to estimate. And this may also lead to the potential difficulty of reproducing results. So given these potential limitations, in this talk, we propose a lightweight generative method that encodes the causal direction of shape changes, and it is therefore inherently interpretable. And this method also provides good prediction performances once it's inverted and is simple and fast to use. 
So specifically, this method has a causal forward model that expresses the direct effect of the variable of interest on image shape. And this is typical of the mass univariate methods that have been traditionally used in human brain mapping te techniques. But unlike these methods, it also has a latent variable noise model that captures the dominant correlations between voxels. And this allows to efficiently invert the model to obtain accurate predictions. So the method exploits association patterns between voxels to accurately predict, and this is typical of multivariate methods. So in this sense, we can say that it bridges the gap between traditional mass univariate techniques and multivariate methods. And regarding related work, it can be seen as an extension of the naive Bayes classifier, where we relax the strong hypothesis of conditional independence among voxels. And there are other studies in the literature that have been proposed to combine an interpretable causal effect with multivariate predictors. And here we cite two of them. Um, but they had to um, artificially enforce interpretability constraints while uh, we do not. But let's now see how this method works. So in the forward model, we decompose the image T into the sum of an average image M, the target variable X multiplied by some generative weights WG, and a noise vector eta. And we assume that this noise is Gaussian with the covariance matrix C. So here we show an example of the generative weights that we computed in the, for the task of H prediction. So the causal part expresses the direct effect of X on the image, while the noise models the dominant correlations between voxels. So the unknown in this model are M, W, G, and C. But let's assume for now that these parameters are known. We can then make predictions about the target X star of a new subject. So assuming that X star is continuous, and if we assume that we have a flat prior distribution over it, it's known that once we invert the model, X star has a Gaussian distribution with this mean and this variance. So we can use the mean of this distribution to make point predictions about the target variable. And in particular, we observe that this prediction involves uh, an inner product between some discriminative weights WD and the input image T star, where the discriminative weights are defined as the inverse of the noise covariance matrix multiplied by the generative weights. So in the end, we obtain a discriminative method that makes linear predictions. So it predicts by computing a weighted sum of the image intensities. And in case our target variable is binary, we have a similar results where predictions again involve the inner product between these weights WD and the input image. But we can now see how we can estimate the model's parameters. So assuming that we have n training pairs, we can estimate them using maximum likelihood. So for M and WG is really easy. Uh, we have a closed form expression. So if we collect them in a matrix W, we have this closed form estimate for it, where the vector phi n is composed by one and the target variable for that subject. Instead, for C, the ML estimate is more problematic for image size problems because of the large number of free parameters, which is of the order of number of voxels squared. So as a solution to this, we impose a structure on C using a low dimensional Latin variable model, specifically factor analysis. So we decompose the noise vector eta using some unknown weights V, K Latin variables Z, and the Gaussian error epsilon. And we also assume that it has a diagonal covariance matrix. So using this decomposition, we obtain that the matrix C can be written in this way. So it's now controlled by a reduced set of parameters V and delta. And V and delta can now be estimated using expectation maximization algorithm. And this method has only one hyperparameter K, which is the number of Latin variables. So the idea behind this is to reduce the number of free parameters in C, but still capture dominant correlations among voxels. So just to give a brief idea of how these iterative methods um, for estimating V and delta works, if we define TN tilde in this way, we can compute the posterior over the Latin variables for subject N, which we call ZN, and we compute it as a Gaussian distribution with this mean and this commerce matrix. And these expressions depend on V and delta. So the expectation maximization algorithm consists of iteratively updating mu n and sigma with the current estimate of V and delta, and subsequently updating V and delta using these formulas with the current estimate of mu n and sigma. So it's an iterative algorithm with closed form updates 
and we just run it until convergence. But we can now look at an example of a trained model. So we consider the task of age prediction uh, based on T1-weighted brain scans of 2,600 subjects from the UK Biobank. And just to give you an idea, training the model in this setting took around three hours. And we can look at the estimated forward model. So we have, this is the estimate of M, which is just the average image in the training set. And this is the estimate that we get for the generative weights that encodes the direct effect of age on image intensities. And now these animations show the most of variation encoded by the first three eigenvectors of C. <clears throat> So they basically show what the noise model is capturing. So we can see that the first one encodes a general darkening and brightening of the image. The second one seems to model a residual bias field that has not been removed from the data in the pre-processing in the top of the head, while the third one encodes differences in the, shape, in the size of the lateral ventricles. But let's now see how this method performs. So in order to assess prediction performances, we consider the task of age and gender predictions based on two unweighted brain scans from the UK Biobank. And these data were already skull stripped and biasly corrected, and we nonlinearly warp them to MNI space. As, as benchmarks, we consider three methods, one for each type. As nonlinear discriminative method, we use the SFCN, which is a convolutional neural network that has been proposed for age prediction and now provides state-of-the-art performances. As a linear discriminative method, we selected the ARVOXM, which um, encourages sparsity and spatial smoothness of its weight as a form of regularization. And finally, as nonlinear generative benchmark, we selected a variational autoencoder that has been proposed uh, for each prediction, and we can look at it as a nonlinear version of our method where the um, noise model is uh, nonlinear. So we train uh, our methods and the benchmarks on training sets of varying sizes. And since the VAE was proposed for only 200 training subjects with a fixed number of Latin variables, to be fair, we tested it only on a smaller range of training sizes. And we selected a test set of a thousand subjects and a validation set of 500 subjects. And this validation set is used for hyperparameter selection. In fact, we said that we have one hyperparameter in our model. The ARVOXM has also one hyperparameter, which is the strength of the spatial smoothness. The SFCN also has one, which is the number of epochs used for training. And the VAE has two, which are two regularization hyperparameters. <clears throat> so we See here the performances obtained for age prediction in terms of mean absolute error. And on the left, we show performances of our method, ARVOXM and SFCN, and we show them in uh, solid lines. And we can see that the three methods perform quite similarly. But since the SFCN um, didn't have an available training code and we re-implemented ourselves, for completeness, we also show the performances are reported in their paper. And we can see that for large training sizes, we are not uh, able to replicate the results. On the right side, we, we instead show the performances of the VAE and our method. <clears throat> and we see that we have a smaller error for each tested uh, training size. Here, instead, we show the performances for gender in terms of uh, classification accuracy. And we can see that our method and the ARVOXAN perform equally, while the SFCN is not able to achieve the same results, even the one from the paper, except for very large training sizes. <clears throat> and here uh, I show the training times of our method and the two discriminative benchmarks, just to give an idea of how long it takes to train those methods. And to be precise, these are uh, training times obtained for one single selected value of the hyperparameter, so the optimal one. And they are CPU times for our method and ARVOXM and GPU times for SFCN. So we can see that when the training size is small, training our method takes only a few minutes, being much faster than the other two methods. When we consider uh, bigger training sizes, uh, our method becomes comparable to the ARVOXM here and then slower for 7,800 subjects. Instead, the training the SFCN um, is lower for every training size. But we said in the beginning that uh, discriminative maps are hard to interpret, and let's now see why. 
So uh, here we show discriminative maps obtained by our method, RVOXM and SFCN, for age prediction. And these maps show where the methods are looking at for making predictions. And our method and RVOXM are linear, so we simply display the discriminative weights, uh, WD, while for SFCN we are displaying the smooth grad maps, which can be seen as a generalization of the weights. And we show them here overlaid to um, a template and also on a white background to see um, more details. So we can see that these maps are first inconsistent with the biology of aging, underlying areas that are not related to the aging process. And they're also inconsistent between and within methods. And this happens because they are highlighting where the methods are looking at for making predictions, but not why they are looking there. If we instead look at the generative maps pro provided by our method in the same setting, so we are using three different training sizes, we see that they, um, they express known age-related effects such as wider suicide and bigger ventricles, so uh, basically gray matter atrophy, and also that they are more stable across different training sizes. <clears throat> and here uh, we can visualize the Again, the big difference between generative and discriminative weights in our method. So the top row contains the generative weights WG and three different slices. And this uh, encodes the direct effect of age on the brain shape. While the second row contains the corresponding slices of the discriminative weights uh, that highlights which areas are being used by the method to predict age. And we can see that there is a huge difference between the two. The question is why there is such a difference between those weights. So we can look at a toy example to understand better for age prediction. So these dots are our data point. The color represent the real age and we discretize it into five different classes uh, to visualize it better. And here we display the forward model. So this green arrow is the causal effect in WG. That is what we are interested in. And these ellipses are the contour plot of the Gaussian noise. Now. If we consider a given data point, predictions for this point are obtained by um, projecting the point orthogonally onto the direction of WD. And WD is chosen such that this projection separates the different age classes as well as possible. And in order to do that, it takes into account the noise structure in order to suppress the noise. And this is why WD is not interpretable because it contains the causal effect of interest, but also the noise structure. And we can see here, in fact, that the direction of WG is very different from the one of WD. For example, the Y component is zero in the causal effect, so there is no age information in that direction, but it is large in WD. So even if there is no age information there, it's still used for making predictions for noise suppression purposes. <clears throat> In addition to the generative maps uh, WG, our method can also provide counterfactual images which for specific subjects, which are imaginary images for specific individuals if they had been younger or older than they really are. So here, for example, we consider the brain of a 47 years old person. These are the real images, and we artificially age it to 80 years. And we can still see the same um, age-related effects encoded by the generative maps. So, for example, the older brain has um, larger ventricles and um, thinner cortex here. <clears throat> but we can now give more insight into the results, the prediction performances that we have. So before we saw that for age prediction, our method and the two discriminative benchmarks achieve similar performances in training regimes up to a few thousand of training subjects. And this is perhaps surprising if we consider that they are very different methods with very different number of parameters. So in order to gain more insight into this behavior, we can perform the so-called bias variance decomposition of prediction errors, and we will do it for age prediction. So it is known that the mean square error can be decomposed into a bias term that expresses how well a method predicts on average, and a, a variance term that says how consistent different predictions for the same test subject are if we change training runs. So this uh, principle is um, displayed in this DART example here. So if we look at the first row, 
we have a high bias. So on average, we are incorrect. We are far from our goal. But there is a difference in variance. So here the variance is low, so the points are close to each other, while here the variance is high. They are more spread. In the second row, we have the same behavior for the variance, but with a low bias. So on average, we are hitting our goal. And just to give you an idea of how we can compute it in practice, so we have M test pairs and B training sets. The mean square error for a specific test subject can be decomposed into this term, which is the bias that expresses how the average prediction for that subject is uh, um, how different this is for the real age. And this term is the variance that says how much the single predictions are distant from the average prediction for that subject, so how consistent they are <clears throat> across different training runs. And then we can just um, average across all the test subjects that we have. So we computed the bias variance decomposition for um, our method, the ARVOXM and SFCN, for the age prediction task, and we use the same training runs that we had before. So here we show the three uh, mean square errors. And here we have the biases and finally the variances. So for each method, uh, the sum of the variance and the bias uh, gives exactly the mean square error for each considered a training set size. So we can see that for mm, smaller training sizes, our method, which is the blue one, has a larger bias and a smaller variance than the benchmarks. And this is somehow expected since our method is less flexible and less flexible methods then do not overfit, but they underfit the training data. And from this comes the higher bias and smaller variance. Instead, if we look at the regime with the larger training sizes, we can see that the variances of the benchmarks are reduced as well. And this happens because uh, the large number of training subjects makes it difficult to overfit also for more flexible models. So in this setting where the, all the variances are small, the most flexible model, which is the SFCN, achieves the best performances thanks to its um, smaller bias. So the bias variance decomposition is the tool for interpreting our results. <clears throat> so um, it explains why a simple method like ours can still be competitive with much more powerful methods, and it's essentially thanks to its small variance. So being a simple method makes it on average incorrect, so a large bias, but it also prevents it to overfit, and this is more than enough to achieve competitive performances. We also computed the bias variance decomposition for the VAE and we compare it with uh, the one of our method. And so we see that the, uh, the fact that the VAE uh, achieves worse performances than our method is explained essentially by its higher bias. Okay, so we saw that uh, our method um, has a linear uh, effect in the causal part of the model. Uh, now we can also look at some extensions of this method. So let's assume that we have L non covariates about the subjects. So, for example, some demographic information that we might want to take into account. So it is straightforward then to add them into the model, into the causal part. So now our model um, has a causal part with the, this is the same effect that we had before that is the effect of the variable of interest on the image. And we can also add our non-covariates <clears throat> with uh, some extra weights, uh, WYL, that will need to be estimated. And then we have the same noise structure as before. So training and predictions can still be done in a similar way as the one we saw before with just minor adjustments. Um, to test if the possible inclusion of covariates can help performances, we consider the classification task of multiple sclerosis patients versus healthy controls, and we added age and gender as non-covariates. So to perform this experiment, we use a um, data set of 262 subjects from, um, it's a private data set from a, a clinic in Munich. And we computed modulated warped gray matter segmentations based on this data, and we used those as input data for our model. And we tested the possible inclusion of age and gender with an extra binary hyperparameter in order to make it in an unbiased way. So in this table, we report the uh, results that we obtained 
with the binary hyperparameter and compare with the baseline model with no covariates. So we can see that there is a minor improvement in terms of accuracy and specificity if we add age and gender, uh, but this is not a huge improvement. We can also look at another possible extension of our model where we add nonlinear dependencies on X. It is also straightforward to do this. So in the causal part, we have the linear effect in X, and then we also add some known nonlinear functions of X with the corresponding weights that are unknown and then need to be estimated again. And then we have the usual structure on the noise. So training this model is exactly the same as training the model with non covariates. Why, for making predictions, uh, we will have to discretize our variable x in order to invert the model, but it's still possible. And we tested this nonlinear version of the model by including a quadratic effect in an age prediction task. And we chose this example because it's known that aging has an approximately quadratic effect on some brain structures, and it might be beneficial to take that into account. So in this experiment, we use the ICSI dataset, which contains over 500 um, images of healthy subjects, which covers a larger age range, so the whole adulthood basically from 20 to 86 years old. And we chose this data set because the, this age span is large enough to possibly see the quadratic effect in age. So again, we used as input data the modulated warp gray matter segmentations computed from this data, and we tested the possible inclusion of the quadratic term using a binary hyperparameter. And we compare this method with the baseline version, so just the linear method. And we report here the performances in terms of mean absolute error, root mean square error, and correlation between real and predicted age. And we can see that <clears throat> adding the quadratic effect uh, helps uh, performances in terms of all the considered metrics. So summing up, in this talk, we propose a generative method for image-based prediction, which encodes the causal direction of shape changes in the forward model. And this is typical of uh, traditional mass univariate methods. But unlike these techniques, it also has a low dimensional linear Gaussian noise model, which captures dominant correlation between boxes. And this allows to obtain accurate predictions once the model is inverted. And this aspect is typical of multivariate methods. We demonstrated that this method is inherently interpretable. We saw an example for age prediction. It also achieves good prediction performances once it's inverted and is simple and fast to use. And we also gave insight into why this simple method provides competitive performances in terms of the bias variance trade-off. And we showed that it's also straightforward to include known covariates and nonlinearities in the causal part of the model. As future work, we could extend this to the longitudinal setting where more than one scan per subject is acquired. And this method is particularly suited for this scenario because it can easily handle the typical variability in number of scans per subject and in time intervals between scans that usually characterizes the longitudinal scenario. So that was it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And I would be happy to answer any questions. So Thank you. It was yeah. very interesting. I'm um, maybe a bit provocative. I start provocative, yeah. like why? Because this is more like an old school uh, machine learning uh, way of thinking. Yes. And now everyone is like, ah, mm -hmm. let's throw this data to some transformers or to some uh, whatever deep learning we have, autoencoder, encoder. OK, there is the there wasn't one comparison with the um, with one uh, one neural networks, but why did you want to go on this way rather than mainstream with I don't know encoder, autoencoder, transformers, or all this stuff? Yes, it's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, so I think basically the the aim of this work is to also raise awareness that even if it's a very very old uh, technique. <laughs> Uh, it, it can still nowadays provide uh, competitive performances and it has other advantages like super simple and the interpretation is really straightforward while with the uh, deep learning methods you have to use uh, explanation methods like post hoc explanation methods and I, I showed like why they might be problematic. Um, so I think 
yeah, we need to make a choice in the very beginning. So there are pros and cons of each method, of course. Like it's not the one is uh, absolutely better than the other. Um, so I think th this approach has some advantages. Um, and yeah, the idea is was to yeah also raise awareness about that <laughs> that can mm -hmm. there can be an alternative. So maybe not just a com alternative, but maybe it can be better for uh, explainable AI also. Yes, for explainability, I think it has some really good advantages. Rather than for explainability, it might be the way. Yeah, interpretability is like one of the main perks of this method. And yeah, that with deep learning methods can be more difficult. Okay. Anybody else from the lab? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but in the end, you were saying that you add some sort of non-linearity as well to the model. Yeah. yeah. How how does that affect the explainability? Because I'm assuming that it's very easy to explain this model because it's linear. Mm -hmm. But if we start adding non-linearities, how can we interpret now the model? Yes. The, that's also a very good question. <laughs> so, for example, if we think about the quadratic effect in ages, so mm -hmm. here I would have like uh, x squared times another uh, weight vector, mm -hmm. um, but we can still, for example, linearize it. So that will mean that um, instead of having just a line, I have a curve, like a quadratic curve, and uh, I can look at the, the slope in each point. So in this case, I will not have only one map for the whole population, but my map would be uh, age condition. So like, let's say for this age range, I have this map, and then for this other age range, I have this other map, but they are still uh, interpretable. So it's even better. <laughs> yes, yes, it can be more specific. Okay. Interesting. That's counterintuitive. Okay, okay. <laughs> Anybody else, or you are all shocked to see expectation maximization in all style? <laughs> you you gave this talk in in Singapore, right? Also. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it ah, was, an, yeah, it was yeah. an oral at Mika. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was remembering that it is, I heard this before. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, I, I didn't have to attend this year, so I'm. Ah, but I know it was accepted by Mika at Mika. Yeah, yeah. And then I I got the oral presentation, and I was really happy to share it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How was it? How did you feel it? It was like. A... I, I think I was a little bit afraid because of. Uh, obvious reasons I'm going against the mainstream <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think the, um, I had really good responses like people were curious and asking a lot of questions also I think we stayed there three hours and a half afterwards like discussing and um, they were like yeah surprised actually that like this method could uh, work <laughs> um, so well uh, but also curious about like trying to understand more and I, I was really happy about the response I saw in researchers <laughs> yeah yeah i actually like this one better than just what you said alex just throw throw in some data to transformers like um yeah that i prefer these ones yeah 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 well, it's the mainstream like we have to it's a bit complicate the uh, situation trendy yeah. code is real available I'm going to release it now that I submitted my thesis. I have time to clean it and uh, and release. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> okay. Then uh, see you. Bye. Bye.